We have to pay attention. What social media has done is hijacked our attention. To place my attention is follow a thread here. It's not about one sentence. It's not about one unfolding. It's about following a storyline. We are here in an impossible moment and yeah. an impossible moment to make sense of everything, an impossible moment for our hearts that are broken. There's no joy here. There's no jubilation here. There's yeah. only a broken heart, but that broken heart can't just be tender. It also has to be fierce. You know, we're asking a question here, which is, what does it mean to be the new human and the new humanity? Where can we orient in the midst of the unbearable intimacy of this moment? Meaning we're intimate with horror and that people can't just be identified by their association and that every human being is potentially in the circle of life and that there's not Muslims and Jews and Christians, that we need to move to a post-nation state and post rivalrous conflict, win-lose metrics world, a world in which no one's outside of the circle and everyone's inside. And we value, right, infinitely the life of every man, woman, and child. If we can find that shared story, then eventually we can make our way through. And if we don't, this just seems like it's going to escalate to absolutely terrifying proportions. Let's just be clear, like our side is life and life has a perspective that will try to illuminate. You know, what is the perspective of life in this madness and chaos? We find ourselves in the midst of a time of unbearable pain. Unbearable pain and sadness. And we ask ourselves, what is there to do? How do we navigate our way through this? Should we remove ourselves? Should we take no sides? Should we listen? I think that's an important part of the process. And also, there's a place to step in and say, no, I do have a side, and that side is life. That side is love. That side is all in for all life. And through this incredibly painful, vulnerable podcast, with Dr. Mark Gaffney, we explore our own window into what we believe is the position, the side, all in for all life, what that means, and how we can tell a new type of story that leaves no one on the outside, no one excluded from the circle. And that's the story we need to tell to be a new human in a new humanity. So we entered this podcast tender and faultingly, trying to feel and see and understand as best we can. So thank you for coming on this journey with us with an open heart and an open mind. And to see what resonates with you, see what doesn't. But find your own center and find if there is a place where you too can say, I'm all in for all life. And what does that mean? How does that look? So thank you for going on this journey with Dr. Mark Gaffney. Well, my brother, we are here in an impossible moment. And yeah. an impossible moment to make sense of everything. An impossible moment for our hearts that are broken. And our hearts that bleed for all of life and the suffering of life and, you know, hearts that bleed for, for the world at this time, a world that's experiencing amazing pain, experiencing a greater pressing of existential risk, experiencing greater conflict and division amongst families and people across the world and nations and all of the structures that we hold. And uh, it's really an impossible moment. And we've made the decision to wade into this impossible moment and do our best to come with um, fierce and tender love and you know our best ability to help share the, the truth as best we can see it. And uh, while holding the multiplicity of perspectives that exist and just try to find our way through. And hopefully, you know, this podcast is of service to many other people who are 
trying to find their way through and understand what's real and understand, you know, how to navigate their own heart and their own mind and their own spirit in these incredibly complicated and incredibly painful times. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Right. And amen. And every word you say is, is true. And our hearts are are ripped apart. You know, we're both, I think, in hotel rooms in different places and we couldn't wait to actually be kind of as it were in studio because this is just not an in-studio moment, right? It's not a moment that's that's organized and prepared or, you know, choreographed in any way or or organized with the right, there's not a moment that has the right lighting. It doesn't have the right, it just, it's a moment that is brutal and 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 confusing and filled with unimaginable uncertainty, unimaginable not knowing, you know, and, you know, we're asking a question here, which is, what does it mean to be the new human and the new humanity in the language of cosmorotic humanism, the new story of value that you and I are so deeply involved with? What does it mean to be homo amor? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a, a mad lover? And to actually find that deep place inside, you know, as, as we were trying to get on the podcast for about a half hour, the tech didn't work. And then in my hotel room, the shower didn't turn off. And it was almost like, like all systems are, are just fucked in the world, right? It was just like, we couldn't even, and just to kind of find our hearts in the center of just this unbearable pain yeah. is a big deal. So maybe I can just start with brother and, and turn it back to you. Just to start, we have to lead with what we know, with certainty. What do, what do we know? What's clear? We have to lead with uncertainty. We have to lead with confusion. And how do I act? How do I breathe? How do I cry? How do I find joy? How do I make decisions of unbearable consequence from uncertainty? Mm -hmm. And so it, it's this moment of what are our certainties? Where can we orient in the midst of the unbearable intimacy of this moment? Meaning we're intimate with horror. Mm -hmm. We're intimate with pain of all kinds. We're intimate with the confusion around the pain. It's not just the pain, but the confusion of how do we even make sense around the pain. And making sense is sensual. Right? To know, mm -hmm. gnosis, yada, and Adam knew his wife. It's, it's erotic. It's carnal. And when eros itself feels defaced, when desire itself feels defaced. So our ability to be sensual, which is to do sense-making, which is to know, right? To come to know, to, to locate ourselves is itself dislocated. And so there's both the objective horror of these last 10 days and the utter confusion, you know, in the, echo chambers of the human heart and mind mm -hmm. about how to make sense, how to find our eros, how to do sense making. And, and so I want to just tenderly offer, as you start us off, that we, we breathe and we lead and we talk and we love and, and we be tender and fierce both from the places of utter lack of clarity to hold our uncertainties and to not fall to the seduction of false certainties. False certainties are seductive. To avoid the seduction of false certainties, to keep our hearts open in the uncertainty, and at the same time, not get lost in a kind of nihilism in which there are no orienting certainties, in which there are, there's nothing that's in any way 
more whole than anything else. That's nihilism. Right? We've lost right our access. Right, but there's certain things are are good and they're true and they're beautiful. We're mm-hmm. not in a post truth world. Right? There's multiple perspectives, as you said so beautifully, but there's not, you know, what Habermas and others described as a perspectival madness, right? Where there's just infinite perspectives and there's no, nothing's better than anything else at all. There's no hierarchy of perspectives at all. Mother Teresa is still better than Hitler, right? In other words, there are orienting certainties. So just mm-hmm. to be in that dance with you with our hearts ripped open between radical uncertainty and, and, and finding the clarities and the certainties, my brother. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that seems like the only way forward. So, you know, from your perspective, what are some places we can go that orient us to the certainties and also where are the places where these uncertainties lie and and I'll share my own uncertainties, you know, because I have so many uncertainties as I've tried to grapple with the breadth of this whole issue and, you know, see, you know, personally see fault on all over the place and also, you know, can try and orient and start to see the threads of the stories, you know, that could possibly make sense that hopefully, you know, in our intention here is, you know, let's be clear, like we're team life. We're team, we're team God, we're team Shekinah, we're team, team all new human, new humanity. Like that's our, that's our side. Our side is life. Right. All, all, all in, in for all life. All in for all life. And that's our, so let's just be clear. Like our side is life and life has a, life has a perspective that will try to illuminate, you know, what is the perspective of life in right. this, in this madness and chaos? Right. What, it, what is the perspective? life is is the most beautiful way to say it my brother right you know it's it's all in you know for all life and life has a perspective and and that's that's so important to say you know that life has a perspective that so c- can we can we listen into the perspective of life so i, I want to start maybe and there's i i think there's obs as you and I have been talking in the last few days a lot, you know, finding our way through, and, you know, in texts and messages and conversations, and there must be about 10 different pieces to this puzzle, without which we can't even begin to align with life. Right? And there's so much that we need to talk about, but, but I want to just maybe perhaps start with two things, and we're starting you know, everyone, there's a word in English, obs, you know, haltingly. And there's a halting quality to the beginning of this conversation, as there should be. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't trust any conversation that dives in with proclamations. We're halting. We're, we're finding our way. That's where we should be now. And I want to just say two, two one, one kind of little one minute introduction and then kind of a first, a first beginning, which is, we have to pay attention. You know, and what social media has done is hijacked our attention. Mm-hmm. We've talked before about the attention economy, where, where attention gets hijacked. And the original lineage of Solomon, the word for attention is sim lev, to place your heart. And so what you and I are doing now is what we're inviting everyone to do is to place our hearts. And to place my heart is to pay attention. To place my attention is to follow a thread here. It's not about one sentence. It's not about one unfolding. It's about following a storyline. There's a storyline. There's a thread. And and there's multiple plot lines, but there is a storyline. And and we have to kind of find our way. And what's the storyline here? And we have to talk about power, and we have to talk about desire, and we have to talk about you know, eros, and we have to talk about bombs, and we have to talk about slaughter, and we have to talk about psychonaut festivals that are, are desecrated. We have to talk about water in Gaza, right? I mean, there's, there, there's so much to talk about, but we have to be willing to bracket 
our desire to let our attention be hijacked by some pseudo outrage before we've actually embraced this all in our hearts. We have to kind of hold for a second. It's that, remember that line that we both like in Braveheart, you know, where, where Wallace says, hold, hold, mm-hmm. right? And that the horses are just about upon them. So if we can just say to all of our, you know, all the brothers and sisters, like, hold, let's, we're going to place our attention slowly. And, and we're going to, we're going to try and make love in this podcast, meaning to restore, restore sensuality, to restore sense making. But to do that, we need, you know, foreplay, right? We need, we need foreplay. We need, we need to go slow. We need to, 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 to touch the issues. We need to feel our way in. We can't just plunge in and penetrate the depth of it, right? We need kind of a reverence. So I just want to invite in myself and I can feel it already in you. You know, it's just mm-hmm. a kind of this kind of heart ripped open reverence as we step in. Hmm. So Abraham, yeah. so this is kind of field one, Abraham. So in the original Genesis narrative, we meet the father of the Arab and Jewish people, Ibrahim, right? He's not a Jewish character. Mm. He's not an Arabic character. He's the father of the whole story. That's a good place to start. Mm. In other words, let's start mm. in the root with what, what, is, what are these two stories share in common? What they actually share in common is Ibrahim. That's so beautiful, right? That there's this figure who, who is Ibrahim, who is Abraham. And there's this moment where the divine voice, however you want to read that, if that's God, if that's spirit, if that's Atman is Brahman, right? If that's Mat, if it's Geist, if it's the implicate order, right? Whatever, however you want to tell that story, but that, that voice, she, what we call she when we're talking, right? In, in deep in the lineage, she, mm-hmm. the Shekhinah, she, you know, she says, hey, Abraham, there's this group of people in Sodom and Amorah, Sodom and Gomorrah in English, and they are completely wicked. So I'm wiping them out. They got to go. These guys are atrocity committers. You're bad folks. They've done bad shit. I mean, they are gone. I mean, now we're not talking about Obs and Mark doing sense making as, as beautiful and as holy and as honored as I am to be in that conversation. We're talking about at least in the literary text, the divine sense maker. So Abraham should say, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it, God. I'm in. Okay. And Abraham says, no way. Maybe there's innocent people. Right? And, and God says, no, no, there's, there's no innocent people. And Abraham says, don't tell me there's no innocent people. I'm going to bring you 50 innocent people. And if I bring you 50 innocent people, you got to, you got to agree not to destroy the city. And God says, not going to happen. Abraham searches around, no 50. He says, okay, forget the 50, 40. And God says, whatever. He says, I'm going to bring you 40. He says, God says, okay. This is a long text of several biblical verses. Mm-hmm. Right? In you know, 18, 19 in Genesis, usually the, the biblical test majors in like little one word, you know, indications or hints or implications or allusions. This is multiple verses until Abram can't find 40 righteous people and he can't find 30 and he can't find 20. And he can't find 10. But he keeps arguing with the divine voice. And finally, God says, you see, you lost. And Abraham says, fuck you, God. That's what you want me to say. That's what a real human being says. Actually, will the judge of the whole world not do justice? I demand that you do not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there's any innocent people there at all. Now, God doesn't agree. It's a wild story. But the point is that Ibrahim or Abraham becomes the father of the Arab Jewish story because he argues with God and demands standing for whoever the innocent people are in the story. Innocent civilians is real. So in this moment, I don't know what Israel should do. And it's an impossible, painful decision. Mm-hmm. Israel needs to do something, right? But, but let's bracket what, what that is because we don't know. Actually, I'm, I'm not in ground control. I don't have all the intelligence. I don't claim to make decisions, right, for Israel 
right? Or, or for anyone, right? From the, the perspective of the public information available, I don't know what Israel should do. But I do know that the voices that are saying across the world, including obviously in Israel, right? That are saying, oh my God, we have to avoid civilian casualties. How do we do that? Do we open a humanitarian corridor? How do we open that corridor? The voices that are saying, right, what do we do? How do we protect the innocent people in Gaza? Right? Those voices are the voices of Ibrahim. Those are holy voices. Th- those are not crazy voices. Those are not voices that are, are not understanding real politic. Those are the voices of Ibrahim. Those are the voices of Abraham. And that the voice that says, mm-hmm. oh my God, we've got we've to save every innocent person. Every single one. And that, and that people can't just be identified by their association. And that every human being is potentially in the circle of life. And, and that there's not Muslims and Jews and Christians, that we need to move to a post-nation state and post rivalrous conflict, win-lose metrics world, a world in which no one's outside of the circle and everyone's inside. And, and we, we value, right, infinitely the life of every man, woman, and child. Whatever we need to do in the end, I don't know. I'm not saying what we should do. I'm saying, but the insane valuation in which Abram argues with God and says, God, I, I, don't, I don't care what information you have, right? And then, and then God's response is, Abraham, because you argued with me, because you took me on, okay, so you're going to be the father, right, uh, uh, of these great nations. That's a good place to start. That's a good place to start, brother, right? And it's that we, yeah. we have to honor, yeah. right, every innocent, right? And, and, and we, have to, we have to hold that voice. And whether or not we go with God or Abraham in the story, Sodom and Gomorrah in the end, right, go down. And Lot, Abraham's nephew and his family, right, escape. So however that story happens, whatever should or shouldn't happen, the Abraham voice demands justice. And there has to be a demand here for justice. Justice has to be a real category. It has to mean something, right, for all of us. So there's not that there's no justice. There is, and there is truth, and there is, there are standards of ethos, and, and, and that all matters. And that's, I mean, that's a great place to start, brother. Yeah. I just want to start there. Yeah. That's, ja. you know, that's such a, such a powerful place to start because as we build this new story, we're going to have to find a, a shared story of value to actually make our way through because in the story of, you know, rival risk conflict, there's, there's seemingly no end because there's different origin stories. There's different, tales of, you know, well, look at the Hebron massacre, look at the Nakba, everybody points to their own evidence for the, for these stories and their own interpretations of how it went down and, and all of that. But if you get back to a shared story, you know, then if we can find that shared story, then eventually we can make our way through. And if we don't, this just seems like it's going to escalate to absolutely terrifying proportions. I mean, Iran claiming you know, recently to the United Nations that if Israel advances its attacks, then Iran's going to come to, you know, to the aid of the Palestinians. So then there's another whole war. And then, of course, at that point, what is the U.S.'s involvement? And then what does the U.S. do at that at that point? And then is this a is this the start of another world war? I mean, we're at the press of like a very, very fucking scary precipice of of where we go. And I think through the pain and through the the brutality of this, you know, mutually on both sides, like people are not hearing that Abraham voice, you know, very clearly. And that includes, you know, that includes, you know, Netanyahu, who in the reports that I've, that I've, you know, seen has said there are no innocent civilians in Gaza. Well, that can't be true. And then there's people on the other side who says there are no innocent Jews. You know, like that doesn't that doesn't exist. And both of those are are clearly false statements, you know. And so there's this kind of this desire to cast everybody into a binary position. And this is not how you argue 
and how you, you know, sense make and argue in the sense of making love to the truth and trying to find, you know, trying to find your heart, which, which can see clearly, the only place probably that can see perfectly clearly through this is, uh, you know, and, and that, that must prevail in this situation or else, you know, it starts to get really, really nasty. And the only winners of that, of that nastiness will be the military industrial complex who will be able to explode their inventory and replenish it with unbelievable amounts of cash. And this has been a story of the war machine for a long time. You know, the real winners of every war are the people who make the munitions. And, you know, really everybody else loses in some way. And, and, and it's not to say that not any war is ever justified. Of course not. You know, I don't, you know, I'm not going to say that we shouldn't have stormed the beaches of Normandy. You know, I really believe we should have. And that was necessary and important. You know, you have family members who escaped and survived the Holocaust. I had family members who escaped and survived the pogroms in Russia. Like, there is good and, and evil. There is right and wrong. And there are times to take action. We're not taking a pacifist position, but simultaneously holding this new story that holds that holds everybody as well and understands that there are there war is a horror and there are no real winners in that and there's you know only you know, only like the noble warrior goes in and say I do the minimum the minimum that I need to do to be effective in this and I do it not with celebration but with a deep heaviness in my heart and a deep tragedy for what for what must be done. Yeah. No, totally. Totally and beautifully said and 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 painfully said and 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 this takes us to the place where we have to begin the next part of the conversation. We start with the voice of Abraham and who demands justice and who challenges the divine. And we 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 invoke the absolute dire need for a shared story of value in which no one's outside of the circle in which we're all in for all life. And from that place, you say, and I think you say correctly, Brother Love, we did have to storm the beaches of Normandy. That's actually true. And pogroms did take place, right, in, in, in Russia and many other places. And there has to be a way in which we actually can actually understand and do thought experiments and avoid what I would call, you know, the original sin of moral equivalence. Moral equivalence itself is, is profoundly against love. To be homo amor, to stand in love, to be a lover requires cultivating of discernment. To love is to see, right? In, in Avatar, in the James Cameron, Cameron movie, right? I love you, I see you. Mm. Right? And in the Avatar movie, there's actually a battle between the people of Navi and Jake Scully's got to take a side. Yeah. He can't say there's no sides. There's actually a side that needed to be taken there. And although there's lots of ways we can understand the fear of, you know, the colonel, right, who is the kind of ethnocentric human who demonizes all non-humans and says they're hordes that should be slaughtered. But although we can we can understand where he's coming from in the end, we go with Jake Scully and we go with the Navi, right? In, yep. in the end, correct, take a position. And, and so I want to just try and offer something deep here before I try and do two thought experiments. So there, mm -hmm. there's kind of three levels of consciousness in the way we think about these things. So there's kind of level one, good guys and bad guys, right? The battle between good and evil. That's level one. And there's some real truth in that. The problem is it was hijacked by too many people in too many ways. And everyone always said, we're the good and they're the evil. And let's wage our battle. It's either, it was, a, as you said before, you used that term beautifully, binary. It was a binary choice, mm -hmm. right? You're either good or evil, right? You're either male or female. No, 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 no. Actually, I've got some feminine. I've got some masculine. I'm not, not so binary. It's not just light and darkness. It's more complex, right? I've got to integrate my shadow. I've got to find my split off parts, right? We, so it's kind of level one is binary, sides. No sides. That's level one. Level two is, whoa, no. So level one is just sides, just sides. Yeah, that's level one. Level two is no non-binary, no sides at all. 
right? Anyone who takes sides, that's a problem, right? I saw an article the other day where someone kind of objected to a colleague of theirs and said, my problem is not which side they took, but that they took a side, right? That's the level mm -hmm. two consciousness position, right? Right, somebody took a side, right? Right, how could you take a side? It's we challenge, and that's not wrong, but that's a, that's a next level. We're gonna move beyond that kind of battle of good and evil taking sides. Let's move to the next level. You know, we don't, we don't take sides. And, and, and just for a second, from, for those of you who want us just to kind of dive in, we can't dive in. We have to set a frame here in order to do sense making. Otherwise, you can't do sense making here. Right? We, we've got to actually hold. And so, so here's level two. Is level two is, you no, know, it's not just light and darkness, but like one text says, greater is the light that comes from the darkness. Greater is the wisdom that comes from the folly. Right, so we, we move past the binary, we try and locate the full range of, of good and evil on all sides. Everyone's got it all inside of them, right? So, so that's level two, it's beautiful. That's not the end of the story, that's level two. It's always she comes in threes. It's always three parts, she comes in threes. And the third level is, oh, there is, su there is such a thing as man and woman. It's not just gender fluid. I, you know, I, I actually can locate myself in some, there's some sense of my man, there's some sense of my women. You know, Hawaii and New York are a little different. Bali and London feel different. There's different qualities. They're actually true. And there's a quality of good. And there's a quality of evil. Mm. And actually, mm. you know, Aragon, king of Gondor, was right when he said, I've got to take on Sauron. And it's very easy to get seduced by Sauron and the Lord of the Rings. Actually, Sariman. Who's Gandalf's teacher? Gandalf's teacher, Sariman, is seduced by this position which says there are no sides, there's no hierarchies of good and evil, it's just raw power. That was, that was his position, right? The other position would be there are no sides, there are no hierarchies of good and evil, everything's just the same, which is a kind of nihilism. And Gandalf understands, and the good king Aragon understands that war is tragic. And horrible and 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 unspeakable and there's a moment in which i need to actually move beyond moral equivalence right and and if i can't do that and i know and i just i just know and i'm just my my heart breaks because i know i can even feel it right now i know that some of the beautiful people listening right they're already no no any any assertion that something's better than something else becomes problematic. So I just want to try and just go into this slowly and see if we can get there because the whole fate of the world actually hangs in the balance. We can't be home one more. We can't create a culture of eros if we don't have a field of value. And value means there's an ought. That's what value means. Value means there's an mm -hmm. ought in the universe, right? There's something that ought be done. That's what value means. That's the definition of value. My clarified desire tells me what's valuable and what's valuable tells me there's something that ought be done. There's goodness, truth, and beauty, right? There's truth. It's not just post-truth. It's not just post-goodness. It's not just post-beauty, right? So, so we can't, we can't engage as lovers and homo and more without that. And so I want to just try and do just kind of a, like a little four part slow and just excruciatingly, excruciatingly obvious but painful and necessary thought experiment because of the unimaginable confusion. So, you know, I have, I have an eyewitness testimony here that came to me, Aubrey, from, from the rave. It's actually sitting right in front of me here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, it's, but it's too painful. It came from a Maor Shammai, kind of a, you know, a figure in the kind of psychonaut, you know, rave scene. He was close to the two brothers who organized, you know, the, the, the festival in the desert where people were actually in journey. They were like deep in journey, deep, like their yeah. heart ripped open, right? There was no Jew, non-Jew. There was no left, right. Everyone was just literally on the inside of the inside of sheep, right? Yeah. And then they, they felt these paragliders, you know, kind of, which were Hamas, you know, men, you know, kind of paragliding into the, the festival. And, you know, I'll just, I'll just give you a little sense of it. I'll just see if I can find it here for a second, but it's, 
it's kind of unimaginable, you know, and, and he, he, he just responds. He's, and he's writing me this message that I, I want to share this message. It's not easy to hear. Please don't play this message where children can hear. And what happened to, to our friends? And he says, when, the, when, when the, the Hamas men came, they took the women, partners of our, our close friends, tied them up, cut the men's penises off alive, right? Raped their girlfriends, killed them, then raped other people on top of them, and then killed them all. And a couple of just the ones that survived told the story. And then they raped the dead bodies and then brought the dead bodies to parade them around Aza. Now, when an editor of Teen Vogue, having read all of the descriptions of the travesty, tweets and says, hey, this is what decolonizing looks like, right? And when students in Harvard, right? The president of Harvard, a professor from Yale, right? But actually just an unimaginable deluge in the comment boxes of social media, which basically says, and this is not an exaggeration on my part, but you can see, you know, clips of people dancing in London, right? Huge. I don't even know if we have it available now, but maybe we can put it in the, in the, in the, in the thread, but just all over the world, not just in Gaza and in Nablus, but all over the world. People are gathering in Manhattan and Sydney at the Opera House, celebrating. This is an affront to everything that love is. And if we can't say that, if we can't make that discernment, if we're afraid to say that out loud, right, then we're not good kings. We're, we're not homo amor. Right? We just, we need to be able to say that and say that clearly. Without yeah. flinching, without hesitating, right? That's actually the outpouring of support across the world saying, you know, one person tweeted, right, you know, who was, you know, from the Democratic Socialists of New York, right? And w with a host of other others, but around, this was a universal cry around the world, right? Did you think that liberating the land would be bloodless? It's never bloodless. It's so completely, and we're, we're just beginning, but so completely misunderstands Eros and Ethos and the storyline and who the people are and what happened. But, but, but besides all of that, it's a horror. It's just a horror. Yeah. So, so I want to, if I can go one more, go please, please, brother. Let me, yeah, let me. Yeah. So one of, well, I think one of the challenges that we experience is that there are people who will say that that story and that eyewitness account is somehow part of Zionist propaganda, that it's all propaganda. And then they'll cite the widely reported stories of the babies being decapitated and saying this story was false, this story was part of propaganda. And of course, I received that story and I was horrified, you know, and, and then there's stories saying that, you know, we're Muslims, we were just attacking, you know, we're attacking only soldiers, even though there's videos of clearly of the other side, and then everybody was like, see, this is all propaganda. And then Israel then reluctantly released some images of dead babies, but still hasn't been able to confirm the 40 decapitated babies. So then people start to say, well, what is actually what is actually happening? And there's a denial that anything bad happened because that allows that story of the side, the that first binary side that they've taken, you know, which is colonizer and colonized. It's, you know, a peaceful people in, in resistance. It's the it's placing them as the Navi, right? And obviously, if we watch the Navi go into the encampment and do some of the horrible acts to the random scientists and people who are just hanging out and the kids and everything like that, nobody would be on the Navi's side. So they have to deny that this actually even exists. So there's this wild kind of denial of the horror and atrocity that came out saying that this is all fifth generational warfare. This is all propaganda. And right, then so, right. people have had to sort through all of this. So there'll be people who even listen to what you just said as an eyewitness account and say, not true, categorically not true. Where's the, where's the, where are the photos and the videos of it? You know, as if right. that's so, the only way that they can even make sense. 
Right, right. I mean, and that's and that's where the tragedy of a broken information ecology and ecology and a broken sense making. Because, and I just want to say it clearly here, right? It is undeniable and incontrovertible. There are mounds and mounds of evidence. So I would even take something like the Holocaust. We have mounds of evidence about the Holocaust. Right? Mounds. We have an enormous Yad Vashem museum right, in Jerusalem. And yet there's an entire industry of Holocaust denial. Right? And, and Holocaust denial, right, which is to essentially murder people a second time. Because when you actually murder someone once, then you at least have the dignity of the memory of being murdered. But when you murder someone and brutalize them and then say that it didn't happen, right, then what you do is you actually create an unbearable evil. And so even, even prominent figures, right, in the left, right, across America, right, like someone like um, my colleague Marion Williamson, right, wrote in her post, right, what Hamas did was undeniably evil. Pure evil, her quote, pure evil. So this is a moment, actually. Let's just create some moral clarity here, right? If we can't say, right, A, that we can actually find our way through, is if we can't find our way through the echo chambers and actually find trusted sources of information, right, beneath the, the, the kind of confusion and actually be willing to say, that there's a fundamental set of moral distinctions here, then we've lost our love, then we're not homo amor, then we're not all in for all life. To be all in for all life means yeah. actually say that when you actually commit acts of intentional atrocity, right? When you actually literally, right, film your murder of a grandmother and put up the film on her Facebook feed, so that's when the family sees it, which is what happened, right? And I can go on and on, right? When we have incontrovertible mounds of evidence, right, that have actually been broadcast through all the modern means of c communicating information, and we can still deny that, so we're not all in for all life, right? We're actually, we, we've actually, we're now standing mm. against life. And I want to I wanna do a very, very simple and painful thought experiment, but it's real. And, you know, there's, there's very, very few things in terms of kind of general philosophy that I agree with my colleague, Sam Harrison. I've listened to five or six of his videos over the years, not a lot, but on all five or six, you know, when he got down to fundamental points, I, I disagreed with how he interpreted sets of facts. So blessings to Sam. But on this particular issue, right, you know, Sam and I intuitively came to the same set of understandings and he came to them and, and, you know, dozens of people did independently around the world. And so I'm just trying to express the way I've tried to talk about this over the last decade. And it's a painful thing to talk about. But here's a simple thought experiment. So in, in the world today, there are actually different levels of consciousness. In the world today, as exists today, that's just true. And one level of consciousness in the world, as routine practice, uses their own people, men, women, and children as shields, as human shields when they're fighting. So we're going to actually put our guns literally on the backs of our children. We will blow up crowds of our children in order to kill Hezbollah, X amount of American soldiers, right? We will place our centers in hospitals, our weapons, munitions, our caches, right? Well, our our, our, our terrorist centers in hospitals, in apartment buildings, in schools, in preschools. We're going to do that as a matter of policy because we know that that's going to force the other side either not to fire or it'll cause condemnation, right, of their fire, right, whenever they go to try and actually respond, right, to our terrorist acts. That's, that's just true. There's an, right? And we, we, we commit war crimes and we actually upload them to the internet. So we're not hiding them, right? We said, this, this is what we do. We upload our war crimes to the internet. That's one group of people. There's a second level of consciousness in the world that actually abhors the very notion that you would use civilians, right? So let's just ask a very simple thought experiment. Hamas in Israel. 
So who can imagine Israel hiding behind its women and children in order to stop Hamas from acting? No one. First off, you can't even imagine Israel doing it. It's unimaginable. And two is it wouldn't work because Hamas would massacre the women and children. Right? <laughs> it would be irrelevant. Hamas regularly does the exact same thing. And it's a given that it's, it's, it's in a weird, diabolical, degrading, degraded opposition to life way, a smart thing to do, because we know that actually many, many Israeli soldiers have been killed because they've hesitated or stopped or not wanted to fire, right? And, and it actually is effective. So this is two very distinct groups of people. It's a very, very big deal. So before we get to the history of the area and what the story is and what the narratives are, and are, is it just a confusion of stories? Is there some way to find a thread? Let's leave all that aside. Just a simple question. I'll just give you a second thought experiment, very simple thought experiment. If Israel was to lay down its arms, this is a thought experiment the way we do it in philosophy. Let's say Israel laid down its arms. We're going to lay down our arms and we're not going to fight anymore. Whatever you Hamas or Fatah, right, whatever you decide to do, we go with you. What would happen? A bloodbath and everyone would be wiped out because the Hamas charter says not kill Zionists, kill all the Jews in the land of Israel. And they cite texts from right a, a very damaged parts of the Quran, which says that every tree and rock will say there's a Jew hiding here. Kill them. And killing every Jew. Right in, right in what that area that's now known as the state of Israel. Right, not, not the actual quote is to obliterate the Jewish state. In other words, that the actual charter of Hamas is the annihilation of every Jew in that territory. That's the charter. Right, period. End of conversation. So if Israel laid down its arms and said we want peace, everyone gets killed. If Hamas would lay down its arms and say, we want peace. And again, this is a thought experiment. There's zero question based on the history, which we'll get to the actual storyline later. What would happen is there'd be peace, right? There'd be a two-state solution. There'd be a state of Israel and a state of Palestine. Without question, there'd be peace. And in fact, we'll get to this a little later. Five times, there's been very dramatic offers of a two-state solution that have been turned down. Categorically, because unless we obliterate every Jew within this area called Israel, there can be no peace. Now, again, I'm, I'm bracketing. I, I'm asking everyone to hold for a second. Let's get to the storyline and how we got here. Let's hold that for a second. But let's just hold the thought experiment. It's a very dramatic thought experiment. It m might be really complicated to figure out what to do in the Middle East, but the problem is pretty simple. One side wants the other side dead. That's actually true. Now, if we can't look at that in the face, Israel does not want the Arab or Palestinian community dead. Israel has no genocidal intention. Right? Israel has offered five times a two-state solution. Right? Quite dramatic one. Right? So let's just understand this. When Israel pulled out of Gaza, Gaza was part of Egypt. Right? Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005, and Hamas took over Gaza. Hamas could have created a flourishing, beautiful state of education and culture and beauty. They didn't. Now we're in. So, so maybe just to, to try and say it a tad differently. Levels of consciousness are real. The evolution of consciousness is the evolution of love. Levels of love are real. Levels of all in for all life are real. It's just a simple example. The German people today, as a collective, are in a very different structure of consciousness than the German people were in the middle of World War II. As Daniel Goldhagen's book from Harvard, you know, pointed out it's books called Hitler's Willing Executioners. And he talks about the, the unimaginably painful experience of a degraded consciousness 
that pervaded an enormous amount of Germany. That's true. And there's an enormous legions of German writers who have addressed this. To not recognize that Germany today is in a different structure of consciousness than it was in the middle of the height of the Nazi Third Reich is absurd. There's, that's a distinction. We're making a distinction. Or I'll give you a, a second example. My dear friend, Fred Jealous, who actually just wrote me beautifully. We did a, a, a weekly One Mountain conversation, a painful conversation yesterday on, on the kinds of things we're talking about now. And Fred wrote me, you know, to thank me. And I thank Fred because he has very much shared with me the experience of what it was like to be a black American. Even in the first half of the 20th century, he married Anne, who's an African-American, his son, Ben. Ben Jealous actually ran for governor in Maryland, became the head of the NAACP, the beautiful man. And Fred recommended to me literature to actually read what that experience was, which I didn't know. And you actually see descriptions, Aubrey, of the whole town coming out. In the first half of the 20th century, the United States of America pledged allegiance to the fucking flag at that moment, right? Who come out to see the, the burning, the killing, the torture of a, a young black man or woman. And they come out in their Sunday best and they take pictures, right, under the the dangling, charred, mutilated corpse. And, and they actually took souvenirs, body parts, which people displayed at their places of business. This is true. So what we're not saying is, I want to be really clear, we're all children of Abraham in the Middle East. So we're not saying, oh, there's an intrinsic structure of Jewish genealogy or Arab genealogy. That's fucking racism. It has no place in a culture of eros. It has no place in a culture of love. None whatsoever. What we are saying is, is that in history, whether in different times in history or in different spaces in history, we have different levels of consciousness. And around the world today, we have brutal medieval consciousness that says, only my God is the true God. And murder is only to murder people who are in my narrow slice of reality, but everyone else can be killed. And we behave accordingly. And, and we create genocidal charters, which is the charter of Hamas. Right? That's true. That is not the same as the Israeli army's code of ethics, where the soldier goes through intense training to even when his or her life is at risk to avoid killing civilians in ordinary combat. Those are very, very different. I mean, I mean, just, just hold this for a second. In the 2014 Hamas-Israeli conflict, which is one of five that Hamas began, but right, 2014, I remember it clearly, Israel made tens of thousands of phone calls, literally phone calls to cell phones of Gazans to try and direct their evacuation to avoid their being killed. So Israel routinely, as part of its policy, does everything that it possibly can do. Do they do it all perfectly? Do they not do it perfectly? It's a good question that we can challenge all of that. But at, at the core of its ethos, right, Israel's position has been, right, we do everything we can, right, to avoid civilians being killed. Now, when you create a structure in which you actually place your terrorists in hospitals in order to put Israel in an impossible position, so then the question is, what should Israel do? So that's a good question, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I hear the voice of Abraham that says, oh, my God, even if there's 50 innocent people. And if the president of Israel says, 
there are no innocent Gazans? Right, if he says that, and I know someone texted me today that he had said that, I haven't checked it myself, I don't know. But if he did say that, I don't know. But if he did say that, he's dead wrong. Mm -hmm. He's dead wrong. Now, what you can say, which is unbearably tragic, right? I can I can have a heart attack as I say it because your heart is attacked. That there were innocent, beautiful German families that were attacked when the Allies bombed. And sometimes the Allies bombed in ways they shouldn't have, the British, particularly in Dresden. And sometimes the Allies bombed in ways that they needed to. And there's no question, Hobbes, right, that as we stormed the beaches of Normandy, which you referred to in the beginning, there's no question that there were, there were innocent Germans. And that's called in war collateral damage, which is just a fancy way of saying, right, and a horrific way of saying that innocent people are killed in war. That's true. And those are impossible questions. And when I sat with the Dalai Lama, I mean, I literally sat with him in his, we, it's a whole different story of how we met and what I was doing in his home in Dharamsala. And he said to me, he says, people say, you know, and his Dalai Lama laugh, ha ha. He says, people say, I say no army. He says, silly. Of course we need an army to act. Of course we need armies to act and we should have actually an international army if we could. In the ideal world, right, these issues should not be nation state issues. We should have a shared grammar of value. And that if any group acts in violation of that shared grammar of value, there should be, as the Dalai Lama suggested to me, sitting on his bed right in Dharamsala, there should be an international body that upholds an intrinsic field of value when it's violated by anyone. But right now, where we live right now, right, to be un able to recognize the distinction or, and I'm going to get even a little bit more dramatic here and it, because it has to be said, otherwise, otherwise I'm a coward and I'm not standing for love, right? But I want to say even one more step. The suggestion that the cause of Hamas's brutality, as I just described it, right, at the psychonaut rave, is the Israeli occupation is a level of ignorance, a level of ignoring the actual thread line and plot line of the story, which is kind of beyond imagination. That's actually not the case. What the case is, and I'm going to be here just very, very tender, but very fierce, and, you know, with the fierce sword of love, the truth is, is that there are, let's kind of just kind of understand this clearly. Let's see if we can go back and kind of understand where we are. This is not about occupation. And let's just take a couple of minutes just to understand where are we? So what's actually true is that there are two legitimate competing claims on this land. The local Arab population that has lived in the land for the last 100, 150, 200 years, unclear, 300 years, whatever the amount of time is, right, but has a real claim to that land that's real. Let's be really clear about that. That's a real claim to the land. And the indigenous Jewish relationship to that land that's gone on also from time immemorial. It's also a legitimate claim to that land. Human beings sometimes have competing legitimate claims. That, that happens. It's okay. When the movement of Jews coming from Europe, you know, 1880s after the pogroms, 1890s, and they came and they joined the indigenous Jewish settlement that lived in Palestine, which was living in peace with the Arab population. As they came together, there were incredibly beautiful relationships that were formed. Right? On multiple levels, there was joint agriculture and there were educational projects and there were economic projects and there were religious projects. And there was a real possibility 
of having people with competing claims actually coming together and, and working something out. And now I'm going to say something that people are literally afraid to say, but it's true. And I've read over the years, dozens and dozens of books, but not just read dozens of books, right? I've, I've lived for many, many years. I shared a house with a beautiful Arab family in Jaffa for years, right? I lived next to Calkilia, right? Near Kfar Saba in Israel, which is one of the four major Arab towns. And, you know, I was the only person to walk through Calkilia without my machine gun. I said, I'm walking through, here I am. I was the 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 rabbi, right, of, of a local right Jewish enclave there. Right. And so I, I literally lived this very, very close. And my relationship to the Israeli government, right, is such that if the Israeli government is in violation of a shared ground of value, I will go to to critique and take them down in any and every way possible. So in other words, the notion of kind of this blind, anyone who knows anything about the, the ethic, right, of this lineage, right, it is not about blindly following, right? Israel is fiercely democratic, insanely so, and the level of critique and the level of social justice movements that live in Israel are kind of unimaginable. It's a pluralistic democracy at the very center of the Middle East. So any notion of a kind of knee-jerk defense of one position, right, violates my whole ethos, right? And that's, that, that's a given. But if we just understand mm -hmm. what happened, so I just want to say what happened, and I want to say some, some really hard sentences here, my friends. But actually, there were huge swaths of the local population. And who are the local population? You've got basically the entire Arabian Peninsula, which was under the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire collapses, it comes under British mandate. So all of the countries of the Middle East, 22 countries, are not 500 year countries. They're not a thousand year old countries. They're countries that were all formed, 1919, 1920, 1922, 1928, right? They're all formed by the British under the British mandate. Now, should the British have been making those decisions? Probably not. So the entire structure was colonial and was flawed in very many ways. But basically, 22 Arab states were established. And then there was a, a fierce contestation over this piece of small sliver of land about the size of New Jersey, a little bigger than El Salvador. And there were huge swaths of the local Arab population we'll call it the Palestinian population, who desperately, beautifully, gracefully held a fierce sense of their Arab identity and very much thought that they could actually create a, a, a new possibility of coexistence with their cousins. We're all sons of Ibrahim. Their cousins mm -hmm. were, were, were coming, like the, the cousins, the family could actually get together. The entire book of Genesis is can the children of Abraham get together? That's what the book is. The central text of the Western world is, it, can the conflict between the sons of Abraham be resolved? And there was this moment, this un, unimaginable moment where, where the sons of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael, right, were actually coming together again. And there was this huge recognition of a possibility. There was, for example, the Nashahibi family, who were the, a massive clan. Right, with enormous economic power, but enormous social power, enormous spiritual depth. And they represented an enormously powerful movement in the Arab world towards deep coexistence. The Nashahibi clan in the 1936, quote, Arab revolt got virtually wiped out by the Husseini clan. The Husseini clan, headed by Mufti Husseini, it was very connected to Jerusalem and Hebron, who later affiliated with Hitler in World War II, the Husseini clan represented this other strain, which is Hamas. Now, Hamas is not precisely Husseini clan, although they were both connected to the Muslim Brotherhood, but they were this other strain of fundamentalist Islam that actually massacred brutally their own brothers and sisters. They did it for decades and decades. The same thing happened on the West Bank. Right, where actually 
the forces in the Arab world that wanted coexistence were slaughtered. And so actually, the leadership of the Palestinian people now is the great betrayal of the Palestinian people. And that's the most, and I apologize, but I'm going to say it straight, vicious. Hamas is a criminal gang disguised Mm -hmm. under the guise of, right, you know, the, the most degraded interpretations of Islam, which brutalize their own people, which regularly slaughter and publicly execute people under the guise of being collaborators, which everyone knows they're not, slaughter, right, their own people. A gay commander gets tortured and killed, right? Israel's the only gay parade in the Middle East, right? Hamas slaughters anyone who's suspected of being gay. Honor killings against their own daughters and wives, if they're suspect of some sexual impropriety, but of course, no evidence need be brought and the woman can be brutally killed, right? The violation of the feminine, the violation of Eros, right? The violation of, of, of actually everything that's held sacred in religion, real guerre. Hamas says, I don't know, Hamas is a criminal gang representing, right? The most vicious expressions, as was Mufti Husseini. That's not true about the Arab world. That's not true about the Palestinians. Right? The tragedy of the Palestinian world is this leadership. But this leadership doesn't represent the Palestinian or, or, or the Arab. It represents a corrupting, a degradation, and a violent, violent, brutal hijacking. I mean, when I was living in this region, there were people that worked with us that wanted to create cooperation and and they didn't, they, they, and, and we said, we, we always said, that right, there was always a clear position of the overwhelming majority of Israel, right? We would always, always trade land for peace. That was a given. And it should be a given, right? I would give back, Aubrey, Jerusalem for peace. You want Jerusalem to be your capital? Take Jerusalem. Take the Temple Mount. It's yours. Peace is a higher value. And that's been the core position of multiple Israeli governments. So so we we have to be willing to understand. And last couple of sentences, just our last paragraph to get through. So in 1936, the Peel Commission, right, set up by Great Britain, right, tries to figure out what to do in Palestine. And they say, let's give 80 percent to the Arabs who live locally and 20 percent to the Jews. Let's have two states. Huge no by Husseini, Mufti Husseini, who kills brutally, murders savagely, right? All of the brothers and sisters in the Nashibi clan. Ten years later, it's 1947, right? There's a partition plan made by the United Nations. Again, majority of the country to the Arabs, small amount to the Jews. The Arabs say absolutely no, not because the Arabs wanted to say no, but because a corrupt leadership hijacked the voices of the people, big no, that's no number two to a two-state solution. The 1948 war breaks out. And in the 1948 war breaks out, let's be really clear what happened. There were two population transfers. That's just true. There were 850,000 Jews. Some of them left voluntarily. Others were forcibly expelled from Arab lands. And they were refugees that were absorbed in Israel. And there were about 850,000 Palestinians, some of them who left because their leaders said, leave, we're going to destroy the Jews and come back. And others were forcibly evicted without question. So let's be really clear. Yes, Mm -hmm. there was definitely part of both of those groups that were forcibly evicted without question. Israel was not meant to survive the war. Five armies attacked Israel, outgunned, outplaned, outweaponed, right, out-moneyed in every possible way, and Israel somehow survives the war. So the war is over. They set up a United Nations Relief and Works Agency to resettle the Palestinian refugees. Seventy years later, that agency still has a budget of a billion dollars a year, right, because the refugees were intentionally not resettled because the infliction of pain on that population for political means was a given for the tragic leadership that they had. And all the 850,000 refugees that went to Israel were absorbed and resettled. So that's actually what happened. And then we get to 1967, 
time three. Again, there's a noose around Israel. Nasser says, I'm going to destroy and wipe you out bloodbath. When people say they're going to do that to you, believe them. Right? So Israel launches a preemptive strike. And then in that war, three, that's when Israel takes Gaza from Egypt. It's called the West Bank from Jordan. Now we're in 1967. Israel wants to give it back. Egypt doesn't want it. Egypt doesn't want Gaza. Jordan doesn't want the West Bank. Right, so again, there can be land for peace. And the Arab League meets in Khartoum with, with the kind of influence of, uh, of that kind of fanatical, genocidal relationship to the Jews. No pos- And they, they issued the three no's of Khartoum. No negotiation, no recognition, no peace. Because that's three, right, in 2007. To, excuse me, year 2000, number four, Barak right, with Clinton there, meets Arafat in Camp David and says, take all of Gaza and 94% of the West Bank, create a Palestinian state, it's yours. Arafat says no, right? And finally, in 2008, Ayod Olmert, who's then the prime minister, adds more land to that. And again, Abbas, right, the successor to Arafat says no. So five separate times, five separate times. Let's be really clear about this. So anyone in the chat threads, if you're not aware of this, right, and you're talking about this, you're not in the storyline, you're not being a lover. So if, if you, you got to really study this carefully, it's a big deal. I know it's hard to hear. It's hard. It's painful. And then last piece, between 2000 and 2008, 2005, Israel withdraws from Gaza unilaterally because Egypt doesn't want it. Egypt won't take it. Israel withdraws from Gaza unilaterally. Gazans elect Hamas, knowing full well who Hamas is, to represent them. Okay, that's, that's Gaza, Gazans elect Hamas, okay. And Hamas at that point could have done something gorgeous. Gorgeous, Aubrey, I stake my life on this. I should be struck dead in this moment if this is not true. Hamas could have built a flourishing state. And a flourishing state. And, and they had, the entire world was pouring aid and what Hamas did is they took that aid away from their original vision of, of, of creating social welfare. They took it away from education. And they literally turned Hamas into a terror cell. And anyone who opposed them, because there's a ton of good Gazans, right? Of course there are. They were slaughtered. Slaughtered, Aubrey. And if we're not willing to speak that, we're not. I mean, I'm not. I can't speak. I'm not a lover. If I'm afraid of comment threads, right, I'm not a lover, right, right? But that's actually, that's actually what happened. Men and women and children, right, who were, who, were, who were the most beautiful humans in the world, Gazans, were slaughtered by Hamas, right, over the last, since 2005, today's 2023. It happens regularly. That, that's, that's the nature of what's happened. And it's like, oh, my God. Right? Let's understand this. Now, does yeah. that mean that Israel is innocent of everything? Of course it's not. Israel's not, and the United States is not. And Israel's culpable, and the United States is not on a thousand fronts. But the United States is not the Chinese Communist Party. They're not the same. There's a moral distinction between the flawed and broken United States, right, and the Chinese Communist Party. are not the same. And Israel is not Hamas. And if we're not mm. able to draw that moral distinction, cha. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for you know sharing that whole that whole piece, and it's you know it's deeply and painfully received as it as it must be. And I think one of the challenges that we're facing now is that I've seen videos myself that say, "Here's how we debunk the story of the five no's." Right. Here's how we debunk the story of the five no's. And here's how we tell the story of the desire for empire. That's the American empire, the British empire, and this desire to colonize and hold power and wield that power mercilessly, create open air prisons for all the indigenous. You know, there's whole narratives on the other side that are well produced and cleverly made and compelling compelling narratives that people are seeing that have this 
contradictory story to the history. So history itself, you know, the story, if we're trying to track the plot line, it, when there's multiple stories, that's where it gets really, really difficult to actually understand because these stories come out and then you're like, well, fuck, what, what do I actually believe? What is true? I wasn't there. I don't, I, I, I wasn't able to see it with my own eyes and, and both sides present this compelling narrative. You know, I was chatting a little while ago with two people that I, I'm very close to and I love dearly. And, and they are, you know, and all of us, any of us who've ever been in couplehood will recognize this because it's, it's, it always exists in couplehood, in relationship always. There's, you know, what do I feel? And what's the storyline? And, and, and those are both legitimate. What am I feeling? What, what's the feeling tone? And what's the storyline? And let's just see if we can track this for a second. Is there a way to create a kind of barometer or is it just hopelessly confused? So let's just check, see if we can track this. It's a fair question, right? And I, I appreciate it very much, brother. So in the end, Israel is a pluralistic democracy in which women vote, women are honored, right? Feminism has a place, the dignity of, of eros has a place, the dignity of desire right, has a place, right? There's fierce contestation between different sides. There's radical critique of the government, right, up and down. There's protest movements, right, every place, right, on anything that seems to violate the dignity of the feminine or the dignity of she. That's the nature mm. of the state of Israel. That is, that is plethoras of evidence, incontrovertible, undeniable. That's just yep. true. Yep. Hamas, running right Gaza, desecrates the feminine, desecrates the feminine body, right? Does honor killings against its own daughters and sisters and wives, right? Violates, right? Right? Anything that even comes close, there's no free speech. There's no elections that are free in any sense, shape or form. There's no sense of democracy. There's no dissidence. You're destroyed, killed, brutally and tortured, right? Ad hominem. So let's just say, can we make a distinction between those two? I think we can. Yeah. I think we yeah. can. And here's the thing. The people producing that confusion, right? Right. The people producing those well-produced videos that if you don't know the store and you haven't studied it carefully, right, are easily persuasive, right, in the attention economies of short attention web silos, right? Those people are supporting Hamas, that they're supporting this position. Those people exploded all over the world in support of Hamas. That is the desecration of eros and the feminine and democracy and free elections. I mean, Israel is a place in which, right, right, a fifth of Israel is Arab Muslims who serve in the Israeli army, right, who participate in Israeli government, who can throw an election, who determine who's the prime minister, Right. So is Israel an imperfect, flawed mess? Israel is an imperfect, fucking flawed mess. And if you want me to start to get to going on critiques of Israel and corruption in different Israeli systems, I could talk about it from today till tomorrow. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot to say. Of course, that's true. But but there's a fundamental distinction. Right. Right. And yeah. And, yeah. I mean, and how many viewers in the chat threads? If they had to make a decision, if they were brutally honest with themselves, let's do a real thought experiment. Let's be real lovers and be in real authenticity. If you were offered a choice, you can live in Tel Aviv or you can live in Gaza. I will wager anything, anyone who's a lover and who's honest, right? How many people in the chat threads from around America, or around the world will choose to live under Hamas in Gaza themselves? How many feminine goddesses we're in the chat boxes, right? How many people have participated, right, in, in the full beauty of the emergence of the feminine are going to say, I'm going to know, I'm going to now go bring my daughters, my sisters. How many men are going to bring their wives and go live under Hamas in Gaza or Tel Aviv? You have a choice. You can go to Tel Aviv or Gaza. I we think that's such a power, yeah, it's such a powerful point to really illustrate because I think there's this narrative that, oh, well, I wouldn't want to live in Gaza just because of Israeli oppression. But people are not realizing the internal oppressive nature of Hamas 
towards its own people, towards the feminine, towards, and that's, I think, where distinction, you know, really is important to kind of recognize here. I mean, the whole world erupted in, in protest and in anguish and in devastation over the death of Masa Amini, you know, who took off her burqa and said, no more oppression of the feminine. And then she was slaughtered. And again, this is a different state. And, you know, the similarities this, and differences. This is, Iran. this is Iran, which is Hamas by Hamas's own public statement and Iran's. Iran is the thought and spiritual partner. Right. According to many reports, actually, the OK for the slaughter was given right by a group of Tehrani officials working with Hamas the Monday before the slaughter. But it's very clear that this has Iran's fingerprints all over it. And you point to Masha Amin, and you're so right, brother, but let's even go together the next step. And again, I, I apologize for saying it because it's so hard to hear, but we have to say it. 14 and 15-year-old girls all through this year were pulled out of Iranian schools and killed by the Revolutionary Guard, right? The allies of Hamas, right? Simply for, for wanting to affirm something of the dignity of their feminine. Right. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Right. And so there's a choice to be made here. And, and here's the thing. There's very few places in the world where there's a bright line between right and wrong. But as goes the dignity of Eros, as goes the dignity of desire. Right. As goes the dignity of of human freedom goes to the world. Mm -hmm. And whatever happens in Israel is going to happen in the United States. It's going to happen all over Europe. It's one world. It's one breath. It's one love. It's one heart. There's no more local. There's no more Muslims and Jews and Christians. We're going to be beyond nation states. This is not a nation state issue. And I wish, by the way, that this, this should not be handled by Israel. My prayer, Obs, is that this should not be Israel's to do. This should be the job of an international force. Sadly, there is no international force of that nature. Doesn't no. exist. But, but in other words, should this be done by a nation state? No. With that, the structure is a tragedy. And, and we need to move yeah. towards that one breath and that one heart and one love. My brother. Because, you know, and part of the problem that, you know, that I see in, in my own critique, you know, from just looking at Netanyahu's comments are, you know, comments like our enemy has only begun to pay the price. There are no innocent Palestinians. And again, we can fact check those and make sure that that's accurate. But from everything that I've seen, even the video, you know, video clips, it seems to be accurate. But you understand that from the lens of the deep pain and anger, which is why handling this response from a place of pain and anger is not going to be the best possible response. It's like, that moment that you've been violated like that, how how you respond, it's it's like that old quote from, from Nietzsche, he who fights monsters must be careful that he does not become a monster himself. Right. right and this right. is a this is human this is human nature that's ultimately playing out. And yes, there are certainly Israelis who've now become radicalized because of the because of the issues and actually probably equally want to wipe out, you know, wipe out Palestinians in, in the same kind of genocidal impulse so, from this, uh, from I, this pain. I, I want to go slow here. So I hear you, brother, right? I, I hear you with all my heart and soul. Like I hear you. And again, I, I have to check what Netanyahu said, right? Or, or what Herzog said, but I would say any, anyone who says that any people are all of a kind Right, has actually stepped out of the field of eros and stepped out of the field of love and stepped out of the field of value. Right. And I want to say, right. I want to be really clear. You can't say that all Germans are of a kind in the middle of the Third Reich. That, that's not a possible statement. It's not true. Right. And I, yeah. I what I can say is that the, the, the overwhelming majority of Israel understands that not to be true. Now there's there's a second question, which is. Right. And, and will individual Israelis, right, violate the code of ethics of the Israeli army? That might be true. And if they do, 
they will be held accountable. So the question mm -hmm. again is, who is your hero? Right? There are, there are always individuals who violate the ethos of the people. In the Hamas world, the hero is one who actually goes, right, stops an Israeli car and kills the children in front of the parents and the parents in front of the children, as almost happened to me, driving the car with my, my children in the back seat. Right? So I, I know it well. I know of what I speak. Right? And that person becomes the hero. In Israel, when someone violates the ethos of the Israeli army, the code of ethics, which is then they're court-martialed and they go to prison. Right? So the question is, who's the hero? Now, the question is, will Israel become radicalized? Right? So my strong belief is that Israel will hold its moral center. The question is, and this is the hard question ops for which I don't have a simple answer. I'm holding the uncertainty and I don't have the information. The question is, did Americans have a moral obligation to storm the beaches of Normandy and bomb strongholds of Nazism, knowing innocent people would be killed? That's not an easy question. That's not mm -hmm. an easy question. But if they did, that means that there is a moral concept that says there's a distinction. Intentions matter. Yeah. Targeting civilians for brutal rape, murder, mutilation is not the same as responding, knowing that innocents will tragically be killed. Those are not morally equal. And, and be able to make that distinction is critical. But then even after we make that distinction, then the voice of Abraham has to come in and say, no, and we reject that distinction. And if there's any innocent people, right, right. And, and that's why this, this shouldn't be done by Israel. This, right. Because yeah. because it's too easy to distort the story. It's why we desperately need to create a new grammar of value, which is a shared grammar of value, which is homo amor, which is all in for all life. And it can't yeah. be it can't be subverted or degraded as an old rivalrous conflict between competing visions of God or nation states, right? We've got to realize we're one breath and one heart and yeah. one love and one desire and one yeah. desire, right? I mean, right? God, brother. Yeah, yeah, it's true. That's true. Yeah. And it's this is a you know this in many ways this is a a contest for the for the soul of humanity, you know. And then the, can we find that shared that shared soul? And you know, it's it's uh, it's become so polarized and so confusing. But if you look closely, you can see the contradictions. You can see. You know, the leader of Hamas saying, oh, no, you know, we didn't intend to hurt anybody. Muslims wouldn't do that, blah, blah, blah. And then at the same, in another breath, calling for a day of rage around the world. You know, like a day of rage, a day of a day of of violence. And just as one way to interpret the day of rage, you know, around the world and calling on the, the activism, which what does that mean? That means, you know, does that mean targeting, you know, targeting soldiers? In, in these different countries who are participating in the war? No, it the, means the leader, targeting the leader, I mean, civilians. Well, yeah, no, the, 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 I mean, let me just have to say that there is a way, and I think we've, we, we've seen today, we can find our way through, right? You know, we can discern, you know, but, but, but I think it's, it's maybe, brother, worth, worth saying maybe, maybe two things here, right? And the first thing that I think we need to say, we need to articulate, is that you, you can't, res what is Hamas? What is the, the degradation of Christianity, right, in the white South, which comes to witness, right, torture of black men and women? These are degraded, collapsed horrors. 
And what we need to do, though, is not respond to collapsed horrors with a kind of rejection of value. That's what we've done is we've looked at the tragedies of pre-modernity, right, represented by Hamas, which is essentially pre-modern ethnocentric brutality of the worst kind, which existed throughout Christendom in the pre-modern world. But Christendom and Judaism met the Western Enlightenment. Islam didn't meet the Western Enlightenment. That engagement didn't happen. And so the classical degradations that lived in Christendom, for example, in the Crusades, but actually have in some sense begun to evolve. This Catholic Pope is not the same, right, as the desecrated popes of the Middle Ages. There's been an evolution of love, an evolution of consciousness. At the center of Islam, you still have martyrdom, and you still have the killing of the infidel, right? And you still have structures of, of tragic thought. So we can't respond to that with a kind of pallid, insipid, postmodern relativism or postmodern stepping out of the field of value. We have to actually be filled with passion. We have to be filled with new stories of desire. We have to be filled with a, a kind of a recognition that we need to actually develop these new churches and mosques and synagogues and, and Buddhist centers of evolutionary love, right? We need a world religion of love, but not love as a pallid, insipid social construction. You go on chat GPT-4, is love real? No, love's not real. Is value real? No, value's not real. Everyone makes it up for themselves. And not that but an actual powerful culture of eros in which eros and ethics are one and we sacrifice for eros and eros and we live for eros and we're we're warriors of eros right and i mean you know that's why it's why it's why people responded to tolkien's lord of the rings right mm -hmm. because as aragon and arwen Right. When all is lost and Aragon can't find his way. And you and I have talked about this before. You know, you know, Arwen says, trust this. And she points to the even star around her neck that lays on her breast. And they begin to kiss and they make love in the dream. And she's saying, trust this, trust the goodness of desire. Trust that the, yeah. the elf queen is willing to become mortal, right, to be with the, with the king of Gondor, even though they're both going to grow old and die because that's the dignity of being a human being. Right, trust the the hobbits of the Shire. Right, in other words, and and, and if we can't, it, we have to reconvene the fellowship of the ring. Right, mm -hmm. in which there's Jews and Muslims and Christians and atheists and humanists and 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 Syrians and Iraqis and Egyptians, right, and and Israelis, right, and and we've got to come together not in an insipid, empty, postmodern, desiccated center where there's no ground of value. But we need to enter the field of Eros and become warriors of Eros and stand for Eros and live for desire and the goodness of desire. And if we don't have that passion and that aliveness that, that you, you live so beautifully in, in, in the Aubrey world, right? And whether it's, you know, fit for service or whether it's, you know, you know the events that you put on where that ethos is, is alive naturally and and, and as we're bringing the Dharma and the medicine together, you know, in our work together, if we don't have that aliveness, so then we've got this empty flatland of postmodernism. And the contrast is, you know, Hamas, that, that's standing for, from their perspective, for value, because they're saying, fuck postmodernism, value is real, God's real, but, but we don't have any vision of it that's real. So they go for the most degraded, desiccated, horrific vision of it. So we have a responsibility yeah. here. Yeah. Warriors of love. I want to go in. I want to go. Uh, amen. I want to go into this, <clears throat> into this, because we've invoked it a few times into this Lord of Rings, Lord of the Rings mythology. So one of the, one of the issues that I could, and the critiques I could say of this is it creates that first stage of consciousness, a clear and simple distinction between good and evil, right? Like Sauron is clearly evil. And correctly identified as that, but all orcs, all unilaterally, all orcs are of evil nature. And there's been a movement to make the Jews the orcs, 
And that's been historical, not only in the Arab world, but in throughout the world, you know, and there's been ways in which people have made the Muslims the orcs. And this creates this kind of racism, this kind of speciesism in that case, but racism of a certain sort. Now, in a properly, in a more evolved story, there would have been peaceful orc communities who are holding their own little orc villages and raising their young and nursing them at their breasts and making sweet orc love. Yeah, it would have yeah. been there would have been this yep. whole other complex complex issue. And then you would have started and they would have been those who would rise up against, you know, orcs who would rise up against Sauron and join the forces of the fellowship. And there would be an orc faction who would who would but this was it was told in such simplistic terms. And I think then you evolve. So if you evolved the story to have this other story of, all right, well, it's not as simple as that. And then you evolve to the third part of the story, all right, where where can we locate Sauron? And you could locate Sauron in the universal forces of evil, Sitra Akra, the dark forces that seek to undermine and de- degrade, you know, Eros, life, goodness itself for the sake of absolute power, destruction, control, distortion. And then you could look at someone like Saruman and say, maybe Saruman is, maybe Saruman is represented by the war machine, the military industrial complex. And there's a, a, a dark covenant between the war machine, yeah. the military industrial complex, and this otherworldly evil. And they get people enrolled in there. So there would also, in this story, there would be humans fighting on the side of, of Sauron. There would be elves fighting on the side. There would be all kinds of different dwarves fighting on the side of Sauron because they've been hijacked into this belief. So it wouldn't just be orcs. So you could make easy speciesist decisions. And then you would have to see, all right, where is this other force? And then it gets complicated because that's also a a position. You know, I talked to a dear brother of mine who's also a a fucking warrior for God and good and value. I trust that intensely. And he locates the evil here in that, in the Saruman, and to use this analogy, he locates the evil here in the war machine. Like, what about the six billion we sent to Iran? Do we not think that that was going to create more war? And what about this that was just designed to create more war so that the machine could propagate more war and that the the wealthy who are running these machines could get, become more wealthy. And then there's a greater move at play to create more chaos, division, distortion, because there's a power play, there's an aggregation of wealth play, and there's a sacred covenant between that and evil itself, capital E, evil, that lives in the sky somewhere, let's say, but also can be found in our own hearts. And so, you know, there's a more complicated plot line of like a story that actually reflects the truth here. Yeah, no, that, that, that is, that is both, both so important. And I don't want to say beautiful in, but beautiful in being able to see it right without being able to see that part of the story. It's an incomplete story, meaning what you're pointing towards brother, which I think is just so completely necessary to say without which we're, we're we're so fundamentally incomplete that the larger story, there is a great battle between good and evil, which is not a level one battle. It's even it's a, it's not a level two. We've recognized that we're all mixtures of good and evil. There's a level three, where there is a great battle between good and evil. There is a battle between between Gandalf and and the Fellowship of the Ring and Sauron and and the Sariman forces on the other side that's real but that battle runs through the heart of every nation and runs through the heart of every person right and that we actually that's what we mean when when we we say in this moment of crisis we have to decide that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do what ibrahim did the father of the arab and the hebrew world ibrahim what he does is is called the crossing Chapter 12 in the book of Genesis, he crosses over to the other side. He says the whole world's on that side. They're lost in a kind of win-lose metrics, and they're dominated by, by the Sauron who, who hijacks the Sariman war machine and your unfolding of it. We're going to cross to the other side. We're going to be fearless. We're going to be fearless for love. And we're going to be warriors of love. But, but that doesn't mean that we avoid realpolitik. Right. That means that we engage Reapolic, that we're willing to make moral distinctions. Right. And others, and I want to just really get this with you clearly. Right. We have to be willing to engage 
in making distinctions. And, and, and then, and, and here's the paradox of it, right? The, the day on the Hebrew wisdom calendar, where you and I once drank a lot of wine, which is Purim, which is this day, which mm -hmm. is the day in which there's a figure called Haman who represents the forces of evil. And there's this standing against Haman, and there's this political triumph over the forces of Haman. That's part one. That's level one story. But level two of the same story, then on that same day, which commemorates this triumph over evil, you're supposed to get so ecstatically drunk, which you and I began to do. I won't say how far we got, but we began to do as we lifted glasses, you know, and we won't talk about how far you could get or didn't get or anything like that. And, public or anything like that. I wouldn't do any of that like on a public podcast, of course. Right. But, but, but we're kind of raising the glasses there. And the idea is you're supposed to get so drunk. You can't tell the difference between the good and evil. Right. And that's what Rumi is talking about when he says, let's meet in that field beyond good and evil. But the field beyond good and evil doesn't mean we don't make moral distinctions. We make moral distinctions. We live in those distinctions, right. and then we recognize that there's this field beyond where it can actually all be good, right? That there's no one who's intrinsically, mm -hmm. there's no people, there's no nation that's intrinsically in their essence on the good or evil side. And that actually that's a decision of every human being and every human community. Are we going to cross over to the other side, right? Are we going to do yeah. the crossing? And the only response, brother, as you and I have talked so many times to the, the meta crisis is the crossing, is that we all cross over together and we create this culture of eros. And, and, and this is, you know, this, I, I just want to, you and I didn't talk about this before, and I, I don't, I'm not tracking closely, but I know that you're, you know, because we are scheduling people trying to get us together. You know, you're you're creating a festival, I think, in Las Vegas, right? Which is a music festival. Yeah. Is that is that accurate? Right. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at, a, you know, I think Chris to send me some of the some of the the language around it. Right. And I loved the language around. What well, I apologize. Give me the name of it. Arcadia Festival Ar for a More Beautiful World. Festival. So, so Arcadia. So when I looked at the language around it, I loved the language because what it was saying is. We have to actually create a culture of eros. We got to come together as warriors and 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 yep. feel the music. And I think there's a reason, my brother, and I, I don't want to break down just shattered with tears now, but there's a reason why Hamas attacked this rave, this music festival. Because this music festival actually represented the, this, this possible culture, right? This, this new yep. possibility. Right. In other words, yeah. the medicine and the Dharma, when the medicine and the Dharma come together, which is what you and I are so committed to, then something new is created, right, which actually has the power to stand against a, a medieval distortion and hijacking and degradation of desire. But it's got to be that mm -hmm. powerful, right? In other words, and and it's it's kind of intuitively that what we call in the lineage, what you refer to, Sitra Akhra, the other side, Saran, Saran understands that you attack the psychonaut on the journey because they're actually holding, I mean, I want to understand what happened here. They're holding the most powerful vision of actually what the world could be. I mean, yeah. it's actually when you kind of hold that, you can barely, you can barely breathe when you say that. And then when that, when, 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 when that medicine is then infused with Dharma, with Dharma, which is drawn from Hebrew sources and from Islamic sources, bring me Rumi, bring me Hafiz, right? Bring me mm. the thousands of Islamic rebel poets, Saint, bring me Rabia, the great Muslim woman. Right. In other words, bring me right the root core of Islam, right, in its gorgeousness, right? And bring Rumi together with the Zohar, with Luria, right, together with right, with, with Teresa of Avila, right, together with right, 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 Narguna, right? And it, it, but it's gotta be with music, it's gotta be with medicine, it's gotta be with Dharma. And 
it's not a trivial pursuit. So when I read your text on Arcadia, that's not a trivial pursuit. That's not casual, right? It, it's, but we have to bring the dharma of making distinctions together with the music, together with the eros, and, and be fucking tender and fierce in the same moment. And, and that's Lord of the Rings. Amen. 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 And, you know, I, I think, uh, you yeah. know, there's so much, you know, so much from this is allowed, you know, a, a clarification, hopefully, you know, in, in myself and the listeners. And I will, I will just speak, you know, my final, you know, piece of uncertainty. Um, I'm not convinced that Netanyahu hasn't been, hasn't, doesn't have a little Saruman in him. And maybe, you know, obviously Gandalf trusts him and, and he trusts that he's leading people and he's part of the, he's part of the good. And there is a small, and I'm not, and I'm not making conclusions. And my uncertainty is not a, a, a insipid, un, you know, my in, uncertainty isn't an insipid and pallid certainty of any sort. But I look at this and I go, huh. You know, from some of the things I've I've heard said, and again, it's filtered, and it's hard to know the truth. But there's a a small uncertainty that potentially this leader, you know, could be actually Sarma. Could be actually we could we could see that it's part of a greater war machine. And I don't I don't know the answer to that. And I think as events play out, and as history as history will be able to see, we'll see where what hopefully what what is actually there. And and what's what's on that side? Because of course, if that's true, and and again, there's a whole vector of people who you know claim a false flag, you know, operation. How did the how did Hamas get in? How did, were they let in? And if they were let in, what was the reason why? Was it for some other purpose? Was it for the war machine itself? And these are all uncertain questions and questions that we don't have answers to. And and there's a part of me that's. You know, while fundamentally the structure that we laid out, you know, absolutely, like it, it seems very clear to me, the players and actors in this, you know, I think we have, at least for me, I'm still holding a bit of uncertainty about, you know, some of the actors and players in this story. And it's it's so unbelievably painful and, and horrific to even hold that possibility. But, you know, from from what I've seen, there's some small part of me that holds that possibility of uncertainty of, you know, is Netanyahu, is he is he upholding the good, the true, the beautiful in his best way? Or has he been somehow, you know, somehow corrupted and become become Saruman in this story? And uh, I don't have any answers to that. I don't expect you to have any answers to that either. Um, but I just want to share, you know, with yeah, the listeners. Yeah, that, no, and, you know, know, I'm, I'm holding that uncertainty and I'm praying. I'm praying that I'm praying that he's not been converted to Saruman and that that's not what happened here. Um, and, you know, I'm praying, I'm praying for all people, you know, <laughs> like yeah. it's been so hard, man. It's been so fucking hard, you know, it's been so fucking hard. Right. I mean, brother, I, I, I hear you. And, and let me just say, and again, and I want to just feel this with you, right? Love. In other words, the, the easy thing, you know, to share and respond now would be just just to hold it with you. But I gotta I gotta hold it in because that's the that's the covenant. You know, we are we are in the fellowship of the ring together, right? We're we're brother we're brothers in the fellowship of the ring. So I can't speak for what goes on BB's heart and soul. You know, in this moment, right? I I'm not in his heart and soul in that way. I do know two things. I know one is it's impossible to know a person through the way that they're projected in the filter bubbles of the attention economy and one, two, deeper, the ethos that BB has upheld virtually his entire life. Whether you're virulently opposed to him, as half of Israel is, right, or 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 or, or supportive of him, as certainly part of Israel is, his ethos has been 
an ethos of a universal grammar of value. It hasn't been a racist ethos at all, right? In any sense, shape, or form. And I, I don't know BB. We, we've, we've conversed only once. I've chatted with him once, you know, at, at an event someplace, right? Where I happened to have a book I wrote, Soul Prince, and I gave him a copy and we talked about the book, you know, for a, for a little while on a porch. So I don't know him well. I would say the danger, the danger is of a different nature. And maybe that's what you're pointing to, brother. The danger is how do we create a new culture of eros, a new human and a new humanity that's not run by a civilizational fabric which itself violates love, which is what a war machine does. Yeah. So in Bibi's position of trying to protect Israel and his complex set of alliances at different times when he draws closer to Putin or makes an overture to China, right? And, and, and engages in a kind of, right? as has become acceptable in the world, there's this kind of acceptability to this kind of game of realpolitik, which violates the field of love. So has mm. Bibi gotten lost in that? So my intuition is that until now, you know, until, you know, the BB that I was aware of, you know, in, in, until a couple of years ago, when I was kind of deeply following these things, I haven't followed it closely in the last several years. But the Bibi that I knew in the time with which I lived in Israel, which was till 2006, was not the person you described, right? I, you know, and I, I, I sat and felt him. It's not who he was. Yeah. Who is Bibi now, right? I don't know, but I do know one thing, Ops. I do know that the nature of the pluralistic democracy of Israel, the feminine arguing, you know, honoring, the desire honoring, right? The, the freedom honoring democracy of Israel, which has opposed Bibi with such passion and with such eros, you know, and they, what they call the brothers in arms, right? Who completely opposed Bibi and kind of opposed the judicial reform, where now at this moment kind of actually completely engaged and actually simply protecting, right? The women and children and men of the state, Right? They took Bibi on, right? The top army, army officers, right? Top intelligence people. So if Bibi engaged in a false flag here, right? I will, I will wager anything that Israel will disclose it and hold them yeah. out. I mean, that's no, the nature of this group. Without, I, I without that. question. If that's true, yeah. this is not 9-11 in the United States. If Bibi engaged in a false flag, which I have no information about, Right? But if Bibi engaged in a false flag of the kind that you're suggesting, Israel will hold him accountable. Right? I agree the, with that. that and, the whole, no and the whole world will. As they should. You know, and it's just a matter of, and, you know, and Gandalf, you know, Gandalf, there was a time where Saruman was Gandalf's teacher and Gandalf trust him and Gandalf right. was not a dummy. You know, so if you go to the story like Gandalf's not a dummy, Saruman couldn't have been all bad at all. But there was some point, some dark moment where another dark covenant was made. And, and that's the only uncertainty that I'm holding. And I'm also holding the, the certainty that if that's the case, that the goodness of the world will discover it, disclose it and find it. And, and, you know, it will be, it will be dealt with because I think in the, you know, in the, in the holding of, you know, hopefully the holding of value, you know, if we can return to this story of value, like I a hundred percent agree with that. He will be held accountable. And, um, it's just, uh, it's such a, it's such a difficult and complex time. And I just felt that, you know, as you, as we started this, there's certainties and uncertainties. And, you know, for me to also share that, you know, I share in, in many of the certainties that you've shared less, less so on the historical certainties, because I haven't done the, the research, but it all makes sense, but also certainties in the story of value, certainties in you know, in this necessity to move beyond 
no, you know, moral equivalency and this universal relativism of all things. Like, I don't believe in that. I believe in the good, the true, the just, the beautiful. I am on team life. I have picked a side. I am team life. I am team God, team goodness. And when I say God, not my God, not that my God is an awesome God and your God is false, in the universal oneness of all reality, you know, conspiring for greater complexity, evolution, beauty, you know, throughout, throughout life. Like that is, that is universally my team. And, and I, I guess this is a moment for, for faith, you know, in a moment for faith that throughout whatever difficulties come, that there will be, you know, the destruction will and yield a creation of something more beautiful rather than the opposite, rather than this dystopic vision of the future, which is also very possible, but it's a, it's a time to, to hold that faith and to stand as strong as we can in, uh, in, in the truth of what we know in our own hearts and feel in our own bodies. Yeah, no, no, thank you, brother. And I, I, I want to, I want to received, 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 no, but, and, and just received. And I want to just on, on, on my side, your side, our side, on, on life's side, I just want to end in a, you know, a, a difficult way, but, but one that I think also needs to be said, right? The, the orcs, and I want to go in the, in the way that you went, brother, the orcs are, are manufactured by Sariman, and who's an agent of Sarah. Mm -hmm. Here's the yeah. thing. The Hamas brutalizers are actually tragically not orcs. And here's the thing. If you go inside the beating breast of a young Hamas boy who was raised in a culture of hate, right? Your, your heart can't help but break because actually he's not an orc. Actually, he's yeah. trapped. And my heart breaks for the Hamas boy who's become a terrorist, right? Who crossed over and committed atrocities. Right, because, because actually, divinity breathes in him, and as he, as he commits unbearable atrocities, he he doesn't actually have the luxury of being immune to a sense of unimaginable shame that actually lives in his body, and oh. so he he feels this unimaginable shame. He's told that he can't trust his body, that he can't trust the goodness of his desire, that he can't trust the feminine, right? That he can't trust his own senses, right? And that the only path, right, to heaven is one that's strewn with him directly inflicting suffering, whether or not you actually cut the baby's head off or you mutilate the baby, right? That's not the issue, really. That's what we're talking about in social media. Was the baby mutilated? Was the head cut off? Babies were mutilated horribly, right? Babies were murdered. Yeah. The, and then there's, the Hamas the pictures, pictures around. Yeah. Right. Right. So, and it's, but that Hamas boy is devastated, is devastated. And the tragedy is that Israel has no choice but to kill him the same way. The American boys landing on the beach of Normandy had no choice but to kill the Nazi gunners. But here's the thing. We can take no joy in that. We yeah. can't have any celebrations about that. Right. When you saw people celebrating right on, on the streets of London, you know, there's something so violently wrong in the culture of love. When you read the description of the lineage of the Egyptian taskmasters, right, and the great Exodus story that Spartacus and, you know, black American spirituals are all based on when the Egyptians are drowned in the Red Sea, right? The, 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 the people begin to sing praise and the voice from heaven says, how dare you sing praise when my creatures are drowning in the sea, right? There's no cause for jubilation. There's no cause yes. for some glory of vengeance, right? Even if we have to commit actions for the sake of the greater good and the fabric of humanity, we do with our hearts broken. And even yeah. if we have to kill Hamas terrorists, we do that with our hearts broken, yeah. right? 
And, and there's, there's, there's no joy here. There's no, there's no jubilation here, right? There's, yeah. there's only a broken heart, but that broken heart can't just be tender. It also has to be fierce. Yeah. Amen. I, Amen. uh, for many, for many years, um, you know, the primary charity that my company on it was donating to was a, a charity called Seeds of Peace. And Seeds of Peace brought Palestinian and Israeli boys and girls together. And they had, a, you know, kind of like a neutral playground area. Well, I know, I know the together. program. And they would, yeah, and they would tell stories, you know, because we were in touch with them because we donated to them every year. That was our primary, you know, nonprofit that we were supporting. And the stories of, you know, at first, they're very kind of cagey and separatist and sitting. But, you know, as they started playing and, you know, a soccer ball came between them. And then all of a sudden they started kicking the soccer ball back and forth, very much like the, the Christmas story in the, in the World War. Like as they started playing and as they started seeing each other, they just saw boys and girls again. They didn't see enemies. They saw actually the, the universal common bond between each other. And then they would go back. And the idea is they would go back to their homes and they would go back to their schoolyards and they would share, actually, I just spent, you know, I just spent a week with a bunch of Jewish boys. Or I just spent a week with a bunch of Palestinian boys and they're awesome and they're my friends. And, you know, this was the idea of like, how do we, how do we see each other? You know, how do we actually, I see you, I see you. And, you know, that's ultimately where we need to get to, where everybody sees the beating, loving, breathing heart of, uh, of the humanity inside. And then, you know, just as if someone breaks into my house with, violent intent, you know, to come and rape my wife or kill me, you know, I have a gun and I will use it, but I will take no joy in that. You know, there will be no me standing over the body of the, of the attempted rapist, you know, and, and, you know, seeing his gun and seeing mine and then, you know, celebrating that there'll be no, it's only sadness. It's only sadness for what drove him to such depravity and also the necessary actions of you know of what had to be done in that moment and uh, and i think you know we've we have lost we have lost that in in many in many ways in in our culture that that sense but also if it happened if it happened to us we would naturally know and it would it would emerge because it's a it's a first value and first principle of the of the cosmos it lives it lives within us this sense of you know this sense of um all three stages of all three stages of consciousness as you as you ultimately put it you know it's it's just true mad blessing brother mad blessing mad blessing to to our children right to my son who's in israel right in this moment right who's who's deeply deeply engaged mad blessings to all of the innocent men and women and children in gaza breaks our hearts and mad and fierce love and discernment and recognition and honor and blessing to Israel for wisdom, for mad wisdom in this time, yeah. right? Let, let love and wisdom and fierceness come together. And, Amen. and Amen. We're, people, we're people of the sword of love. Yep. And let us wield it. I love you, mad brother. Thank you. I love you, Matt, as well. And thank you, everybody, for listening and tuning in and and hearing us explore this impossibly painful and difficult situation. Uh, We love you as well, even if you hate us after this conversation. Like, ultimately, it's it's uh, it's your part of life and, and we love you for that. So all in for all life, all in, all in for all life. So it is. Thanks for tuning into this podcast with Dr. Mark Gaffney and myself. Obviously, by the time this podcast airs, many things will have transpired. Probably many horrific things will have transpired. But we hope and we pray that all of this tragedy and all of this horror awakens a greater spirit for all humanity, a greater understanding of ourselves, and a greater understanding of what it means to stand all in for all life. Sending you love and blessings, whoever you are. 
May peace and love and joy find you in your life, even in the most difficult situations. <laughs>